Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you are. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hilary Mine, and I'm the president of Digital Europe. I'm also running strategy and technology uh, for part of Nokia. We have um, an important topic today on connectivity. Europe has a growing connectivity gap, uh, not only relative to uh, Japan, Korea, China, but also the US. In 2021, 5G reached uh, 62% of uh, Europeans population as opposed to 93% in the US. It's fundamentally due to a long-term impacts of a regulatory environment that has been quite singularly focused on reducing prices to consumers and fragmentation of policy, particularly spectrum policy, but also business environment that characterizes Europe versus its peers. Moreover, we face today a new set of fragmentation challenges around security. So we see today um, uh, countries defining their own security rules, which again, uh, threatens to set us back a little bit versus other markets. On the current trajectory, uh, as you'll hear today, Europe will most likely continue to fall further behind. Why does that matter? There's no digitalization without the right connectivity. Competitive connectivity is literally the backbone of a competitive digital society. And there's no green without digital. With the excellent move that the commission made to devote 20% of the 723 billion EU stimulus package Digital Europe gave clear recommendations for how member states could go about maximizing the fund's impact in several areas with the release of our paper on how to spend it. Connectivity was front and center in terms of priorities with a particular focus on connecting rural areas and boosting growth in traditional sectors. Today, our, we have a remarkable panel of experts uh, who are gonna discuss both the paper's findings and also the constructive steps that we can take to catch up. I'd like to turn over now to Cecilia bonnefeld Dow. As the Director General of Digital Europe, to take us through a bit more of an introduction. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Hilary. And, um, and thank you for taking the leadership, not only in this, but also of Digital Europe in general. Um, let me uh, introduce the, uh, the report that we have done. So we have started uh, um, researching the reasons why we are uh, having relatively low figures on connectivity in Europe. The report is called Mind the Gap and uh, How to Empower Europe Through Connectivity. It's really an attempt to look at what are the mechanisms that have slowed down the, the, the enabling of connectivity in Europe and what can we do about it? So really in a constructive approach to, to the problem. So let's look a little bit at um, the, the state in, uh, and, and the status in Europe. Uh, if you can flip to the next slide, please, Anna. So um, only around 69% of the rural homes has a fixed broadband subscription compared to 81 uh, in the urban areas of Europe. If we look at 5G, uh, it has reached uh, 62, as Henry said, uh, percent of the European population, whereas in the US, for example, it's 93. So more than a year after the final implementation date for 5G auctions, there are only seven member states that have assigned spectrum in all three 5G PNA bands. So we are pretty, there is a long way to go still there. Uh, mobile average revenue per user. So this is about prices and what Hillary's talked about just before, a very big focus on consumer prices in Europe they are only, it's only a third compared to the US and it's less than half of Japan. And of course, with low revenues, it means low profits and it means the lack of investment, private investment capital. So uh, if we look at Europe, there is a huge difference in how the market is structured. So we have uh, 47 major operators in Europe. Uh, there is seven in the US and there's three in South Korea and Japan. Um, so how come? Uh, well, there's also been a, um, a, a view that we would not like to have two large operators in Europe, meaning that they could merge. Uh, if you can't merge, then you don't have the scale of production that you need to bring pr prices and or costs down to compete. So all in all, this has really hampered the, the, the investment environment in Europe. 
not that we don't say that it's okay to have low prices and good prices for consumer. We are all consumers in the end, but it also has a cost. If the two ends meet that you have higher cost and lower prices in the end, what, what is the investment capital that you have left? So uh, let's jump to the next slide. So we did the study and the idea was <clears throat> to basically say, okay, there we have some of the world's absolutely leading infrastructure providers. In, and even the commission, they've set really clear targets. We want more connectivity, more 5G, more innovation. So how come we have this slow, uh, slow uh, adoption and and uh, and deployment on high capacity networks in in Europe? What's the reason, and what can we do about it? So the idea was, and the objective was to map the deployment of these very high capacity networks in Europe to identify the main obstacles uh, to this deployment. Of course, to define uh, possible solutions and to assess the digital decade targets. Are they the right ones and or are there additionals not in there yet? So we've interviewed a connectivity expert from our organization, from corporate companies and from academia to listen to their expertise on how to go about all this. Let me flip to the next slide. Okay, so what are the key findings? So um, let me take the next slide, please, Anna. So the key findings, uh, there are four major key findings. First of all, so what are the, the question was, what are the factors that are hampering European leadership? First of all, what we heard before is this delay of the spectrum auctions. It's simply too hard to purchase uh, in an efficient way the spectrums that you need to deploy um, the, 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 the networks. And, uh, and around 70% of the experts think that that is the main barrier to basically the deployment of these uh, high-speed networks. So lack of return on investment, that's what we discussed uh, before, low prices, but also higher cost. And of course, that's due to uh, lack of scale of economics, as we discussed before. If you have smaller units, you have less scale of economics. But it's also due to what Hillary, for example, um, mentioned just before, that many of the member states, they basically define their own way of uh, testing or their own way of certifying uh, these networks instead of having one European way of doing this. It means additional costs in each single country if you want to operate in country and many other factors of fragmentation uh, that is found specifically in Europe compared to the other markets. So what is, I would say, the most worrying finding is that it seems a little bit that we have, people have given up. It was said, it's a lack of confidence, of confidence that Europe can lead in 6G. This is, of course, not very good news because we used to always believe that we were the best in connectivity and now they say, can we lead in 6G? And, you know, there is a lack of confidence that in this market, we can actually continue to lead also on 6G. So, um, of course, this is all about how we can change that. So let's jump to the next slide. On finding number three, uh, you know, public funding, we have heard about this great resilient fund and how the commission has put, you know, 20% and a lot, of, a lot of the money is actually going to connectivity. But is this actually enough? Is this, uh, is this actually covering the gap in market of investment? And there is a clear view here that it's great, it's an accelerator, but it's only an accelerator. We need to fix the, the private uh, market to make it well-functioning, to get lower costs, to get uh, more value, less, uh, more focus on, on value and, and less focus on cost. Uh, it, and it will be inefficient, uh, insufficient, basically, to change the landscape. So there are reforms, there are different governance things that we also need to fix if we should have any chance of changing this. So, um, well, there is a, a support for the for the 2030 uh, connectivity targets, but there is also uh, found to be a lack of focus on 6G. Um, and many of them says that the targets are simply not ambitious enough. So I guess that stems for a place where the specialists say, if we are the best in the world, why is it that we don't set higher targets? 
if we can invent it, we can talk a little bit like it's a similar situation with the microchips. We are leading in design and uh, research and development on microchips, but still we have very, very little of the world's production. So how do we, before it's too late, on connectivity actually change that situation and being aware that without a functional capital market, a functional private investment market, this will actually be uh, the same situation. So uh, let's jump to the next slide. And the next again, so this is all about the recommendations. So there are four major recommendations. First of all, a strong European governance model. We heard about the fragmentation of testing of certification, et cetera, in the member states. How can we streamline that and be sure that the players in the European market have their own, you know, one European way of doing this and, and that products and services can get to market much faster across Europe? Um, this is also about the Connectivity Act, really looking at European implementation, uh, even European institutions to do so, instead of having 27 different in the member states. We all know that it's a fight of, you know, wanting to keep, you know, the mandate at national level compared to EU level. But honestly, it's we don't have no time to discuss if we want to reach a more efficient market. Also, the policy makers and the implementers need to be much more efficient in their way of handling rules and regulations. And so the other one, and number two, is make networks investment top priority. Back to, OK, it's uh, good to have a focus on prices. Always good. We are all consumers. We support that. But we need to be realistic. If we have higher cost and lower prices, there is no investment left. So how do we get back to a, a stage where we have more focus on, you know, creating quality uh, networks to create secure, you know, networks that we have value add into what we are doing, recognizing that this is not only about consumers, but this is also about security. This is about innovation. It's about the quality of networks. And, you know, this is no fast business. I mean, building these networks are crucial for our stability, for our security, for our uh, also raising the whole uh, digitalization of the society. So how do we get back to actually putting value into this and not only looking at the lowest price possible? Thirdly, is implementing the connectivity tool. So uh, toolbox, sorry. You know, there are many things that actually uh, is stopping uh, how can you say barrier, concrete barriers, administrative barriers, accelerate, for example, the permits granting. One of the, the, the hardest thing is, you know, get a permit to dig or to build or to put the, the, the stations. It takes forever and it's a high cost game. Um, also, I mean, urgently make available all three uh, 5G bands uh, under the investment friendly conditions. So we heard before that only seven countries out of the 27 have actually done that at the current stage, you know, in spite of us being one year uh, over time on the impl last implementation date. And, uh, and of course, I might have forgotten in, in the first one, it's all about harmonizing the spectrum auctions and make it possible for the, for, for the companies basically to purchase these bands uh, in scale and get some... Uh, decent deals on actually utilizing these networks. So uh, good use of funds, uh, use these funds now immediately, get them out and working on ground, making sure that we are building these networks and that we have the investment environment uh, boosted and let it really function for a catalyst for, as, for further private investment. Without the private market and without more value and investment in the private market, this will only be a, a bump uh, and we will go back to where we were before uh, and not really, really improve the situation. Let me jump to the next slide. So today we have with us, uh, you know, five distinguished speakers uh, to discuss this. We have uh, Rita Wiesenbeck, who is the director of connectivity for GD Connect uh, for the European Commission. We have state secretary uh, of uh, the Ministry uh, of Transport and Communication of Finland. We have Pastora Valera, who is a senior vice president from Cisco and also a board member of Digital Europe. We have Michael Beck, who is the corporate officer of uh, Ericsson. 
And uh, he's also a board member of Digital Europe. And uh, last but not least, Cristiano uh, Radelli, who is the vice president uh, of uh, Anitech Asinform, our Italian member. Uh, who's been working also with connectivity for many, many years of his life and a board member of Digital Europe. So let's flip to the next slide and, and ask ourselves, uh, you know, at least, at least two questions. Will Europe have leading connectivity players you know, in 10 years? Will we actually have those players or will we be in a microchip situation where, you know, all of a sudden there is a shortage and we find us actually... Uh, out of European players in the market and uh, even international uh, in, um, foreign investment in Europe on this area, because there is simply not enough mo uh, money and investment in market. Or, and how do we guarantee better connectivity for the future generations? So uh, with that, and let me hand over to Alberto Di Felice, who is a director of uh, our Privacy Security and Infrastructure Unit in Digital Europe. Over to you, Alberto. Thanks a lot, Cecilia, for the introduction and the overview that was very passionate of the report that we launched today. I know it's, it's a topic that you care deeply about. And also to Hillary for your introduction to, to the event. So let me bring up the, uh, the speakers that you already uh, introduced. We have Rita uh, Wesenbeck uh, from the Commission, Kari Antilla from the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications, Pastora Valero. Uh, from Cisco, uh, Mikael Beck, Ericsson, and Christiana Rodaili from Anitech uh, Aston Forum. The latter three, obviously, we're very pleased to also have on the board of Digital Europe. Um, and we're very happy to hear from all of you. We heard quite a lot uh, on connectivity, a lot of points to, uh, to discuss, agree with, and also, I think, you know, possibly disagree with. And we want to hear from the speakers uh, what they think. Uh, and obviously, uh, noblesse oblige, the, the commission uh, and, and our institutional speakers will obviously go first. And Rita, I think it's fair to say that, you know, for, for someone who joined uh, DG Connect in December 2020, which I think was the deadline for implementation of the code, this must be a very passionate discussion in and of itself, right? So I'm not going to ask you about the regulatory part, because you also came on board when the uh, recovery funds effectively were uh, were announced. Uh, and clearly the commission and, and, and the units that you oversee in particular have been tasked with reviewing the national plans, which obviously were, were given high priority uh, from the commission side because of the importance of the funds. Now, having reviewed you know, what's, what's come in from the national plans, right? What is your assessment? How hopeful are you about the use of funds for connectivity uh, in the years ahead? Um, yes, <clears throat> so thank you very much, uh, Alberto, for this introduction and also for inviting me. And I think uh, actually I should not start this discussion with also devoting at least some attention to the fact that uh, many of the players around the screen, uh, if we cannot say around the table, are uh, also telecom companies who are deeply involved in uh, helping Ukrainian refugees at, at this time. So I think we should uh, perhaps not overlook that for today. Um, but uh, if I uh, talk about um, uh, your question concerning is the RF going to make the change? Uh, I think uh, one of the words that is often used in the context of uh, the RF, and I would personally certainly subscribe to that, is the word unprecedented. Uh, it is unprecedented that the uh, European Union has this uh, amount of funding available to help the twin transitions in this case, so digital and green. And also it is unprecedented, uh, the, the responsibility that now goes to the member states and uh, our colleagues to allocate these funds in the, in the right way. But if I then look at uh, the money that is available in the RF and the plans that have thus far been uh, submitted and approved, then actually also this stems relatively hopeful because we can see that 27% uh, of the funds that have been um, uh, allocated uh, are going to digital, which is exceeding the target for digital that was 20%. And actually quite a considerable amount is going also to, um, to connectivity. So um, I think that the front runners there are Italy, who is devoting 50% of its digital budget to uh, connectivity. Spain, 22% uh, of its uh, budget to connectivity. And Greece, 9%. So these are, these are basically very hopeful uh, elements. And I find 
Also, um, what is really uh, stemming hopeful is that many of these countries have very well considered and well designed plans that are in which the connectivity is part of the whole, um, let's say, design of the digital society. So also that uh, is, is a very good and hopeful sign. Lastly, also the RF is not only about investments, but also about reforms. And we were particularly happy to see that a number of member states have also put the reforms that they have proposed in the context of the connectivity toolbox, also in the RF plans. Now, I don't want to monopolize the, the floor too long, but RF is, of course, only one element of the broader picture. We also have other uh, funding available. I mean, the, the big element is, of course, CEF Digital, on which we just uh, um, published the work program and the calls are underway. Um, there's also the EU Invest Fund and there's the um, Connecting Europe Broadband Facility that basically was a large success in combining public and private money. So uh, essentially, at the European uh, level, the RRF is only part of the puzzle. And then finally, but let me close with that, um, there's of course also a lot of national funding available. And also here we worked from the Commission side because there was both on the state aid front, a new general block exemption proposed and adopted. And there are the new state aid broadband guidelines, which widely open or open wider to a wide extent uh, the possibilities for member states to provide national funding for the rollout of, uh, of, of networks. So let me stop at this. Thanks a lot, Rita. Also for sticking to time, because again, the, the purpose is to make this <laughs> interactive as possible. So I hope we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So I'm going to move to uh, Takari uh, now, obviously, uh, from, uh, from Finland. And Finland is one of the countries that are universally uh, acclaimed uh, and mentioned when it comes to best practice, particularly when it comes to to spectrum, and we've heard a lot uh, also from from the survey and the answers uh, in in our report uh, that there still appears to be that prob problem of, of fragmentation, and there's quite a lot of of, of concern about the way that the five G auctions uh, overall in Europe have been conducted. There have been considerable delays, and Finland was the odd one out because Finland auctioned all the bands. Uh, on time, um, which is which is quite uncommon, and also I think you know uh, with best practice also when it comes to uh, the the price that people had to pay for the spectrum, so that people can spend more on networks as opposed to the the auctions themselves. Um, clearly, other countries are 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 less uh, sticking less, if you will, to best practice. Um, what do you think are the uh, persisting reasons for that, and do you think there can be like a a longer term discussion among the member states about doing this better in the future. Thank you. Thank you for good introduction. And, and that means that we have a big challenge. But if I tell something about Finland, and it's honored to be part of this digital Europe connectivity discussion today, uh, I trust that with this kind of multi stakeholder. Uh, discussions we will take further step towards a world that is even more connected with 5g infrastructure as it's inside to be sure in finland we believe that the good cooperation and active dialogue between the sector and the spectrum authorities as we well as among the authorities themselves is one of the main reasons why some might call finland a trendsetter country in 5G development and deployment. We have al already had a lot of good cooperation with other member states to share best practices in radio spectrum policy group and connectivity toolbox box special group. In addition, our impression is that member states also discuss bilat bilaterally and want to learn from each other. We are, of course, willing to continue this useful cooperation with other countries. However, I would also like to add that this is also important that the EU sets ambitious time periods for taking frequency and into use. Uh, Finland is a pioneer 
on an international scale in terms of mobile broadband and 5G as well as 6G. And one of the first countries to build commercial 5G networks. As one of the first countries in the EU, we, EU, we auctioned all three EU recognized 5G pioneer bands and almost 80% of our households already have access to 5G networks. We believe that innovation enabling regulation, proactive spectrum policy and good cooperation have critical roles to play here. These are the cornerstones in Finland's vision in practice, innovation, enabling regulation and proactive spectrum policy mean that policymakers serve as enablers in promoting the 5G ecosystem. Good cooperation means that we engage in ongoing discussions within industry and we work in close cooperation with our international partners at all levels of policy making. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, next up, I have Pastora Valero from, from Cisco, uh, who is also uh, an expert on particularly on, on regulatory discussions that we've had on, 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 on telecoms uh, for quite a while. Telecoms regulation is a long story in, in Europe, right? It's, it's been going on for quite a long time. We have quite a lot of experience. Uh, so in your assessment, what, what, what do you think of, of this investment? that we have in Europe? Do we have a gap? What's it about? So what sort of incentives can be, uh, there's some echo, I, I'm, um, I hope it's not coming from me, but maybe it is, because I'm the only one with the microphone on, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, and with respect to this gap, what types of incentives can we identify to fix the gap? Thank you so much, Alberto, and thank you very much for having me and having Cisco in this discussion. I think the short answer is yes, we have a gap, and I think we all agree we've made a lot of progress, but there is still a gap in quality broadband, high capacity broadband. And in terms of the recommendations, uh, already Rita and um, and and uh, Cecilia alluded to a few of the of the policy and the you know the incentives that we could be thinking about. So, firstly, um, we know that in order to reach the coverage, in order to make sure that no one is left behind, and we saw this very, very clearly during the pandemic, people that were not able to continue to work or to continue to you know, be educated, we know that we need um, public sector intervention, we need public sector funding. We have today, and Rita, you alluded to the unprecedented nature of the, of the recovery fund um, and the uh, focus on both accelerating the digital transition and the green transition. And the two go hand in hand. You cannot have a green transition without digital. So I think, you know, as industry, we're really very encouraged by this stimulus. One thing I would say, I mean, like many of the companies that are probably joining us today, we're engaged in many countries, trying to um, establish ecosystem, partnerships, collaboration. But I think the, 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 the key challenge here is the speed, right? We, we, we have to do this at a much accelerated pace. And I think, you know, from government's perspective, making it easier to tap into these fundings, make it, you know, reducing uh, red tape, I think it would be absolutely, um, absolutely key. The other thing in terms of, you know, stimulus and, and, and public funding, of course, Rita, reviewing the stated rules to make it more uh, predictable, to make it easier, the coordinated investment uh, and, and, and the use of money for connectivity. I think that's also something that we definitely welcome. Um, then if you focus on, on the demand side, I think it's important not to lose focus of demand because the demand side is what, what would actually um, allows monetization of these huge investments. And as we know, the vast majority of the infrastructure is going to be led by the private sector. And so again, public sector has a role also to stimulate the, the, the demand. Um, if you think about the stimulus in particular, we're going to see digitization across many sectors, whether it's mobility, healthcare, education, digital services. And so that is something that I think uh, we, we should continue to focus, transforming the economy, digitizing the economy. And all of those digitizations will in turn serve as you know, ways to monetize this huge investment. Uh, 
regulatory we i'm not gonna you know deep dive uh in the introductory remarks but i mean clearly the, the, you know the, the the incentives and the regulatory the implementation that we do and we're still doing of the electronic um, european electronic communications code is important that it should enable um you know lighter regulation for co-investment infrastructure sharing and also the focus that right now we're discussing on you know do we need to review the broadband cost reduction directive are the things that we could still do to simplify the processes to coordinate civil uh, works, etc. And then spectrum, I, 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 you know, I need to just underscore what what um, uh, Cecilia said in terms of we all know um, the delays on the auctions, the high prices, the fragmentation. This is something we really, really need to tackle in Europe. Uh, and it's really important and, and we need more. Basically, we need more spectrum and we need more harmonization. And we need both. We need both licensed spectrum and also unlicensed spectrum. And this is about 5G, this is about private 5G, this is also about Wi-Fi 6. And so that's my last point in terms of, you know, no one solution fits all. Uh, we need to be very clear about a technology neutral approach. Um, there is a mix of technologies and different use cases will require different technologies, whether it's fiber, whether it's satellite, whether it's 5G, private 5G, Wi-Fi. And it's only with a combination of all of these technologies that we can really achieve the, the gigabit targets. And I'm going to stop here, Alberto, and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks a lot, Pastora. Okay, so I'm going to move uh, on to the next industry uh, expert that we have on the panel, uh, Mikkel, back from Ericsson. You're also one of the experts that we actually interviewed for uh, for the report itself. So we know exactly well what type of questions we asked uh, you and your colleagues. And one of the uh, recurring uh, 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 responses that we had, particularly when it comes to the 2030, mobile targets is that all the targets are about 5G and there must be something wrong here because people, a lot of people expect 6G, 6G to be available. Uh, so there, there's this feeling that there's something lost in the mobile targets. Can you expand a little bit on that and, 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 and explain to us where that comes from? Absolutely. So thank you for having me here. I've been part of this industry for a very long time and, and of course being part of earlier generations as well as 5G and 6G. And I think it's it's extremely important to have 6G targets and to have an ambition from, from the commission, but also from the member states, given that we know that there is a division of responsibility. I think what we, what we have seen historically is, of course, that it's been extremely beneficial for Europe to be leading in, in the early standards. And actually 5G also started in Europe with the uh, EU project called METIS that was in 2012 that led to the trial systems and the way we built the early engagement also with the industries and some of the non-traditional users we saw for 5G then being utilizing the technology for efficiency and so on far beyond the smartphones. So I think that's super important. Then of course we're in the early days. So if we started real activities maybe 2015 more in 5G, I think it's a couple of years until this is really the target for, for the full discussion. For us, it's mainly in research and uh, also with, with partnerships with many other companies, universities, with the commission and so on. But I think it's, uh, it's also important to, to learn to crawl before we can walk and run here. So many of the things we talk about in, in 6G and we sometimes talk about it as the Internet of Senses and so on. I think many of these cases will, of course, start in 5G, where we, for the first time, have built a system that is really tailored for, for serving the demands of, of society, of government digitalization, or more or less digitalization of all the industries that we, we see around us. And, and for Europe, I think this is super important, given that we can really... Uh, I think someone in the beginning talked about the semiconductor industry in my view, we are in a much better situation from the start, even if we are late in, in 5G and telecoms, given that we have a few of the leading companies in the world in the telecom side, and we have quite many of the leading companies on the industrial side that will actually benefit from this transition. So I think that merge is, to me, a, a really important thing for Europe to, to utilize, not only telecom isolated or the digitalization of industries uh, isolated. Then, of course, um, 
Europe is a very heterogeneous market, and uh, it's it's um, it's very important to have the, uh, the Secretary of State from Finland here to talk about. I think a country where we have done many things right when it comes to especially 5G, when it comes to the licenses, when it comes to removing hinders and hurdles for deployment. I think a lot of countries could you look at that example. Uh, every single step might not be magic, but in the combination, it's been really, really beneficial for the country and for the future competitiveness. I think that's something to really watch. What we see is, of course, that there is a number of things holding back in Europe today. It's it's anything from the basic financials of, of the operators that are supposed to invest. They have to have money enough to, to actually be able to invest. It's the hurdles, the lead times to get the permissions to, to set up a base station. It's um, making sure that you have available spectrum, especially on mid-band, that we see as the, the real killer when it comes to deploying a system that will really give the benefits that we thought that 5G would give. So if I look at a couple of important facts, I think uh, really deployment of um, mid-band massive MIMO systems, um, that is really what we have uh, used as the base for the performance in 5G. And that will really be key for the connectivity targets for 2025, 2030 in, in Europe and to really deliver the goals we have set on, on 100 megabits and going up to one gigabit. Of course, it's not only 5G, it's, it's fiber as well. But I think we will need to push forward in a higher speed. Otherwise, I think there is a risk that we will actually not reach those targets. And uh, I think we should also look at the models working with uh, corporations between governments and private entities when it comes to there's been a lot of discussions now on, on IPSAs and other tools to support build out of, of um, infrastructure and so on in a way that doesn't really uh, skew the market. So we are very active in that debate. I think we we have looked at Analysis Mason as one source of information that has estimated that the industry will invest something like 110 billion euros until 2030 in these technologies. And that is a big money, but if you look at the actual amount and coverage of uh, equipment that would really be able to fulfill the targets of what people would think about as 5G, it's maybe 30, 60% of sites and it may be less than 10% of the geographical area. So when it comes to, for example, uh, uh, automotive using uh, our systems, then of course it, it's very important to look at what for example, what happened in Germany when you have a special focus on road coverage and things like that. So to me, this is a very different system than what 4G was to really make sure that smartphones work in a good way. And therefore, that will also take, I think, a conscious view from the governments uh, in order to, to really see this as a competitive tool. And I've been working a lot now in, in um, Korea, in China and Japan and so on, and you see a, a very strong push from these governments to really see this as a competitive tool for the country. I think we can do the same in, in Europe as well. I think it's super important. And uh, we, we see that this is one of the key things also to do early. I think we discussed this a little bit before that many other technologies will actually have to rely on that we have a connectivity-based system with high performance where you can base some of these use cases. and some of the things I'm talking about have quite long lead time, both when it comes to spectrum, when it comes to regulation and also practical build out. So I think it's very important that we have uh, a proactive policy when it comes to that. Some of these investments actually have to happen before many other things can happen. So by that, again, saying the 6G is, is a very important step, but it really will and have to build on, on 5G. So I think it's super important to tie them together. Thanks a lot, Mikael. Uh, next up, and last in the first round of speakers, we have Cristiano from our Italian National Trade Association, Nanitech Asset Forum, and you, uh, like Mikael and Pastor, also sit on the Digital Europe Board, as, as I said. And we've heard also from, from Rita uh, that you know she was praising Italy, uh, and it's good to, to see Italy uh, in the top spot for once for spending 50% of the digital RRF funds on, on connectivity. Uh, but we also saw, as part of the Italian strategy, the ultra uh, broadband plan that was launched 
uh, last May, again, comprehensive plan that was launched by the, the government. Uh, and that focused on seven areas of action, which includes white areas. And also, I think something that was uh, highlighted by Pastora, demand side and uh, best practice from the public's uh, side of things. So there's plans for connected schools and connected hospitals, for example, which I think are uh, very, very important. Uh, so clearly, this is still the, the, the early months of, of that of that strategy. Uh, but you know, what, what's your assessment, and does it look like something that is is best practice itself when it comes to national plans? So thanks, uh, thanks, Alberto, and thanks uh, for the question, and thanks for inviting me to attend to this to participate to this interesting uh, panel and discussion. Yes, I think uh, um, there is a, a major effort from the Italian government also utilizing, of course, uh, the European funds uh, in order to uh, put forward and make really a major step uh, in, uh, in providing connectivity throughout all the Italian territory. The overall plan accounts for uh, 6.7 billion euros, so it's quite a large, uh, a large plan. And the concrete objective of the strategy um, is to bring connectivity to one gigabit per second on the whole national territory by 2026. So if we succeed in that, we'll be even ahead of the European target set for 2030. The plan, as you were anticipating, is uh, consists of seven interventions, seven areas, two of which are already underway. There are two points that are based on strategy 2015 and the other uh, five are of strategy 2021. The first point uh, is related to what's called the piano area bianche, so white areas. I guess uh, uh, these terms are used all around Europe, so we call black areas the areas where there are at least two operators uh, investing, gray areas the area where at least one operator is investing, and white areas, the areas where no operator is investing because there is no return, no expected return of investments. And so they will invest only following, let's say, uh, subsidies from the states or from, from the union. Um, so in this case, uh, on the white areas plan, uh, the work are, are proceeding. The tenders have been uh, all awarded. And uh, there we constitute on some on FTTH, so fiber to the home, and other on fixed wireless access with the connection of 7,416 uh, Italian municipalities, approximately 8, 4 million real estate units. So it's a major, it's a major effort. And uh, um, the target uh, is to enabling service for over 100 megabit per second on all public uh, administration offices and all industrial areas uh, falling in this area. So in addition to the, to the uh, public, let's say, to the normal people. The second that has already started and, and completed is a uh, uh, voucher for families. So family of low income, uh, that are that had no connectivity or let's say services lower than 30 megabit per second could have asked for a, let's say a support from the states in order to get funds for uh, for having reimbursed the connection. So the plan is has been completed with a surplus of resources. Uh, the surplus of resources will be utilized in the phase two of the voucher that is a connectivity to corporation. So in these cases, uh, there will be a financing of 600, over 600 million euros, including also the advances of the, of the previous plan. And uh, each corporation will be able to, uh, each company, to request a contribution from a minimum of 300 euros to a maximum of 2,500 euros for ultra broadband connectivity services from 30 megabit to 1 gigabit. So this plan is starting. Then there is uh, uh, one of the major point is uh, plan Italy at one gigabit. Uh, we provide connectivity of at least one gigabit in download at 200 megabit per second in upload in real estate units uh, all around, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, Italian, uh, the Italian territory. And uh, um, let's say the, the target, as I, I was saying, is to reach this by 2026. Fast internet will reach another 7 million addresses 
and uh, the government uh, is making available almost 3.7 billion euros uh, for this. The call has been published and the submission for offers uh, is expected, uh, is due by March 31st. So the, all these uh, plans are really moving. Some, a couple have been already completed, the other are, are really moving in, the, in this period. Then there is the, the plan Italia 5G, um, that uh, is supporting the dissemination throughout the country of 5G mobile networks. Uh, um, so this, uh, the target is to ensure a significant leap in the quality of mobile radio connectivity and uh, basically on two line of action. One is uh, fiber optic backhauling, <coughs> sorry, bindings, uh, the radio base stations. The other is a densification of network infrastructures in order to guarantee speeds of at least 150 megabit per second in downlink and 50 megabit per second in uplink. The allocated resources are over 2 billion euro. Uh, the call is to be published soon. The other um, plans of more importance in the seven are the connected school. The call provides for intervention to connect with symmetrical speed of at least one gigabit, almost 10,000 uh, school um, throughout the Italian territory. The supply and installation of the network, technical assistance and maintenance. Um, the, the infrastructure activities must be completed by June 30, 2026. Allocated resources are over 260 million. And the due date, the call also in this case has been published. The due date is March 15, 2022. Then there is the connected healthcare facility that is also very ambitious uh, to ensure connectivity with symmetrical speed of at least one gigabit per second and up to 10 gigabit per second for healthcare facility from clinics to hospitals. So uh, more than 12,000 public health service structures will be involved in this national, uh, let's say, really um, speed up in the, in the connection. Uh, also in this case, the call has been published in due March 15. Uh, last one is uh, the plan, uh, let's say, minor islands, which uh, is the connectivity to smaller islands all along uh, the Italian peninsula in order to assure a high speed connection through um, microwave or through installation of submarine fiber optic cables and related maintenance. So these are the plan and as you can see, um, is really detailed and, and uh, really precise in the target and uh, it's moving, let's say, practically all the tender have been or assigned or the due date is uh, within uh, this month. Thanks a lot, Cristiano. Sounds like a, a very well thought out uh, plan, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll let Rita as well comment on it because uh, she's probably best place to do that. Uh, but before you comment on the Italian plan, uh, first I'm going to com commend all my speakers because you've all been short and snappy, so we have time for a good second round and, and, and a nice Q&A session. So I would encourage the audience to uh, keep the questions uh, coming so that we can ask uh, uh, more interesting questions of our speakers. Uh, but Rita, I already mentioned you arrived uh, at Connect in December 2020. Um, when the code was supposed to uh, kick in. Um, so you, you, I, I guess you must be sitting there and looking at the, the survey that we produced um, as though we are uh, mildly crazy, you would say, because effectively, you know, we see in the survey that uh, we still see a lot of the problems that effectively the electronic communications code was uh, proposed, was put forward, especially, uh, by the commission at the beginning to solve so problems specifically around uh, spectrum auctions how they're conducted uh, putting investment as one of the objectives of telecom regulation in addition to competition and the like uh, and effectively we've seen from the survey and the answers that we've gotten that a lot of these problems seem to still be there and there seems to be an urge to have you know to go back to the regulatory basics and to rediscuss some of those points, because if we don't move on those fundamentals, it will be very difficult to change the long term investment trajectory. So, again, simple question to you is, do you really you know, do, you, do you can you confirm that, you know, to you, this sounds absolutely crazy that, you know, we're, we've had an 
of the code. You have a relatively long list of member states that are yet to implement the code, not to mention the delays in spectrum options that we've seen already. Are we completely crazy to be thinking about regulatory reforms already? Oh, well, so that's that's quite a complex uh, uh, and um, how you call it, um, multi-dimensional question. Let me first say with respect to the Italian plan, I would certainly maintain the word unprecedented. I find uh, it, it sounds like a, a plan ticking very many boxes, but at the same time having a coherent uh, vision on how society should, should develop and also unprecedented in the sense that it is on time and that it's actually delivering on uh, on what is being proposed. So that's really very good and to be commended, I think. Now, on the question whether we need a new code or a new connectivity act or, or a, a new element, well, you know, you already gave the obvious answer. We first need the code to be implemented. So, um, uh, so in autumn uh, last year, we issued um, 20 recent opinions to the member states that they needed to implement, and we are now preparing infringement procedures uh, with respect to the, the late uh, transposition of the code. It may not be entirely 20 member states, but still too many member states are behind. And that has a, has a distinct effect on issues that you raise in the, uh, in the report. For instance, in the sense that the code creates a, a framework that is aimed to incentivize investments in the sense that it um, incentivizes um, co-investment, it incentivizes network sharing, and it incentivizes whole, wholesale only constructions. So if the regulatory framework is not in place, it is much more difficult also for regulators to assess those kinds of constructions. We are seeing them, but it would be much better if they fit into an existing national framework of rules. So that is, that is one of the first elements to discuss. Second point is, indeed, with respect to the spectrum, I don't know whether I have the figure now here available. We are, of course, moving forward with the spectrum auctions. We know the member states are doing their best. Uh, but overall, 57.3% uh, of 5G spectrum has only been uh, allocated. Now, actually, one of the good things that I would like to signal also of the code is that it has created the so-called peer review process. And quite a, a number of member states have used the possibility to basically discuss their plans with respect to spectrum auctions, also with other member states, which is very much to be welcomed. Now, then the question, what more do we need? Well, first of all, if you talk about spectrum, this is something that is very dear to my heart. And um, um, it, it is um, seen as uh, something that is uh, clearly um, you know, also causing the fragmented markets, and it is. Um, so, so if we talk about the issue, for instance, uh, addressed by Cecilia in the beginning, where she says, well, we have in Europe, uh, I think, over 40 telecom operators, and it seems that we are against large operators. If that is the case, that is largely because mar markets are still national. And one important element of these national markets is the fact that spectrum is allocated nationally. Now, we have done quite a lot in the code, but more needs to be done. And just to mention, in the Digital Decade Policy Program, we have proposed that part of the roadmaps that the member states will submit to the Commission implementing the Digital Policy Program will uh, also consist of describing what are the plans and what are the deliverables with respect to spectrum. But this is something that is not so easy to digest for the member states. And of course, there is a long-standing issue of competence and sovereignty which is understandable also for the for instance, security elements connected. However, we feel that if we want to come to a European digital transition with clear targets that require a European infrastructure and not 27 national infrastructures, it is important that Spectrum is part of that. So we have proposed that Spectrum is part of the roadmaps so that it will be possible to have more predictability and have, for instance, a database. We would really hope that the industry supports this, this claim, and we would also hope that the industry will come with business cases linked to the digital decade targets that illustrate also to member states who stand to be convinced that it's necessary to have a more converged allocation of spectrum. Now, one uh, issue could be the vertical use cases, 5G corridors, for instance, also clearly, 
but it's important to have this debate with the member states and also with the European Parliament. Now, other elements that I would like to signal, but probably they go too far and I don't want to monopolize the floor, but I don't think we need a new connectivity act, but I do think we are working on elements to further incentivize um, uh, investments and also to make it easier to quickly roll out. Now, clearly we can mention the connectivity toolbox that is getting a follow-up in the BCRD review, the Broadband Cost Reduction Directive, and the aim of that is very down to earth to have more spades in the ground to make it quicker to obtain a permit to have transparent uh, licensing procedures to have coordination with respect to the um, the rollout of infrastructure so that is all very important in 5g we have a regulation incentivizing and making it much easier to roll out small cells so many of those um, let's say uh, initiatives are already taken then with respect to the access um, or the, 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 the pricing element, we of course also receive loud and clear the call that uh, competition should not be solely focusing on price regulation, but should also look at other elements. We're looking at the access recommendation, it's being revised. And part of the uh, reflection is in which cases do we need price regulation? And in which cases can we have other tools like non-discrimination obligations, other elements which make it unnecessary to have a detailed pricing uh, obligation so also their work is ongoing and then finally with respect to the demand issues that were raised i mean i am a, a great believer in our digital decade policy program and i think that all the targets and also the actions like the roadmaps that have been proposed there will definitely incentivize also the demand side of the market so we're working on high computing infrastructure. We are working on quantum computing. We're working on 5G corridors. We're working on health, uh, on EID. We're working on um, digitalization of the public sector. We're working on digitalization of SMEs. Now that is really working on the demand side of the market. And the member states will deliver that on the basis of their uh, national roadmaps. So I think plenty of work is being done. And I would say that this precisely illustrates we don't need a new framework, we just need to implement what's there. Thanks a lot, Rita. And this is actually a great segue for the question that I wanted to ask Kari, right? Because your, your argument is very clear that, you know, we have a lot on the table that we're doing. Uh, you just said, you know, the code effectively hasn't been implemented yet. So we need to figure out how to make it work first before we can understand whether we need to change anything there. And you, you mentioned the connectivity toolbox you know, quite, quite a few times, because clearly that consolidates, you know, all the good practice, all the good stuff that should be done to, uh, to unlock uh, investment in the connectivity situation. Um, so my, my question to Kari is, you know, exactly, um, and I think this is an area where the, the report is also very clear that, you know, the connectivity toolbox is very much uh, pushed by the interviewees as uh, an immediate term thing that all member states should be looking at and implementing as fast as possible to improve the situation. How far do you think that can go, Carly? And also, what do you think the long-term impacts of doing that can be on investment? Thank you. I guess that the toolbox is very important. Uh, but at first, I like to highlight the importance of the connectivity. Uh, it will enable to digital trans Session with reliable and com comprehensive communications networks. It answers to our needs concerning work, study, public and private services and with our everyday life. It also promotes competitiveness and well-being by ena enabling the utilization of different services. The connectivity toolbook, toolbox is a good example of sharing the best practices of broadband deployment among EU member states and learning from each others. As the connectivity toolbox actions are recommendations, it gives the member states a good chance to choose best actions for their own needs. Finland also promotes uh, the deployment of high capacity networks by following the actions set down in the Finland's implementation plan 
of the connectivity toolbox. For example, to improve the sharing of physical infrastructure and joint construction, we have established a physical infrastructure expert group that currently includes more than 30 organizations and about 100 experts. The group of experts is coordinated and chaired by Traficom, an agency under the ministry. The members are, for example, Association of Finnish Municipalities, telecommunications companies, interest groups of telecommunications companies, network operators, energy companies, etc. Uh, the task of the expert group is to see common practices, define common guidelines and operating principles and review operating models and processes so that shared use of infrastructure can take place better than before. We hope that the close collaboration between different sectors, organizations, municipalities and state agencies will more often encourage network operators to closer cooperation. Also in network deployment and shared use of infrastructure. This could be a significant, significant factor to reduce cost of construction as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Harry. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, Pastora in, in running order. Um, I think one of the elements that uh, we always focus on is uh, comparisons between Europe and other geographies, because you, you can only understand how good or bad you're doing uh, if, if you look at what others are doing. Uh, and, and clearly, we look at the US quite a lot. Do you think that these comparisons are, are fair? And, you know, if anything, what is it that we can learn from looking specifically at the U.S.? No, thank you, uh, Alberto. I mean, I, I'm always worried with these comparisons, right, because the markets are so different. But I think it's always useful to compare yourself. How are you doing, right, versus your competitors, versus other, versus other nations? Um, and, and we've already mentioned in terms of 5G, for example, if you look at the U.S., they are indeed leading on 5G availability. But, but having said that, if you look at the connectivity speed, um, clearly the US is falling short compared to all the countries that were there also early to launch 5G. Um, and, and, you know, this is related to the use of um, lower band spectrum and types of technology. But I think um, what's important is also to see, you know, the types of policies um, in public sector, like in the, in the EU, um, has stepped in as well. Uh, we had uh, the, 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 the 1.2 trillion infrastructure bill um, that has a significant fund of 65 billion for broadband deployment, particularly to address rural areas and market failures. Um, from a regulatory point of view, Rita, you mentioned, you know, it is true that I think the focus in, in the EU uh, overall has been very much on, on driving competition, but also prices down and maybe a little less focus, and it's a difficult balance, but a little less focus on driving investments. And, and if you look at the US, you know, obviously they don't have wholesale regulation, they don't have price regulation in the same way as we have in, in Europe, but they also have a very different market structure. So I think it's different to compare, but I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a good reflection that we need to do um, in the EU, uh, particularly as we implement the electronic communications code. Can we, you know, think about more investment friendly regulatory um, implementations. And then uh, from, a, from a technology point of view, the US clearly has you know, a, a plan that includes future-proofing broadband technologies, uh, 4G, 5G. They're also be, they have also been looking at open RAN, as we know, and I know this is a discussion that it's happening as well in Europe. Um, is this a technology that potentially could give faster speeds, flexibility to upgrade, uh, lower the total cost of ownership? And they're also uh, clearly ramping up um, the next generation wireless on 6G. Um, and, and I think the other thing that I think we're doing in the US, and we're doing in Europe, is really a fostering public-private partnerships, which are going to be critical for the rollout of 5G um, use cases and also the private 5G use cases that we are starting to see emerging in some of the um, verticals and in, in the industrial verticals. So I, I would just say that I think it's also important to think about global corporations. Um, Hillary in her remarks talked about standards. We have now an opportunity with the EU, US Trade and Technology Council that was launched 
that is going to be looking at 5G, 6G standards, joint research on innovations. And I think, you know, clearly uh, at Cisco, we would like to foster more cooperation uh, between the EU and the US on, on uh, standards around emerging technologies. So all in all, I think, uh, you know, there are good practices on both sides. And I think we just need to um, reflect on these issues and then see what, what works best given the market conditions of our, you know, of, of the different markets in Europe. Um, Alberto, I don't know if, if we'll have time to cover. I see that there is a question on the chat about cybersecurity and I'm happy to just comment briefly. Yes. Maybe you want to do another yeah, round. Do that. Feel free. Feel free. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the question is cybersecurity about, I mean, this is a really important question, right? I think it's, it's, it's cybersecurity is something that we're all in. We all have a role to play governments in terms of setting the public policy, in terms of securing their own networks, in terms of making sure we have enough cybersecurity professionals, because as we know, there is a acute shortage of cybersecurity professionals. The service providers obviously have a role to secure the network, to have operational control, to use you know, trustworthy vendors. And we as vendors, we need to ensure that our products are secure and be vigilant. So um, all in all, I would say it's, it's, it's not a barrier, but it's something that we need to be uh, very, very focused, and it's it's all of us, it's all of the stakeholders, and clearly at Cisco, you know, this is our number one priority to make sure that our products are secure, that we embed security end to end, and that in turn we helps our customer, you know, to operate secure networks. Thanks a lot, Pastora. You mentioned partnerships uh, quite a lot, either explicitly or explicitly, and there's another partnership that's usually uh, called a, a transition, but it's really green and digital. Um, and, and I think Ericsson has been one of the companies, among, among many others, that have published quite a lot of, of studies and, and been speaking a lot about the contribution that, that digital and 5G in particular brings to transitioning the economy toward a greener path. Um, so, Michael, I was wondering if you could expand on that, you know, maybe just, you know, give your, uh, your sense of where this would be leading from an economic perspective, particularly with a focus on Europe. If you look at the industrial sectors that you have, you know, where do you see that impact manifesting itself first? And I think that's a really good question. We have been active since very long in something that is called the exponential roadmap, which is a cooperation between many different companies and entities on, on looking at the wider impact on uh, digitalization and systems like 5G. So I think what we have seen is that for the green transition, and I think it's it's really, really good to see that the uh, commission is connecting green with digital. I think, to me, this twin transition is maybe the most important tool we have for the for the net zero target. So what, what we have estimated in that study with, with quite a lot of facts behind it is that there is a possibility for a 15% CO2 emission decrease that is really coming from digitalization of these classical industries that has used very few of these tools historically and it will vary across sectors i think we are in one sector where digitalization can can maybe do even more as we've seen on ways of working and what we're doing right now over video and so on and some classical industries will be slower but overall i think it's it's a very big number and a very big part of the overall target we also see that with modern technologies like 5g and so on we could possibly even increase that number from 15 percent so i think for what we are talking about here we have also been lobbying that together with cecilia with b20 and in, inside the g20 work in italy last year for example really to push that it's not only a european question this is one of the biggest things i think we can do for the net zero transmission and i think for us then what is very key is that when we as a company talk to people like uh, many people on this call, in order to be credible, we also have to show the way that we work with our own supply chain, with our own products. There is a debate if, if 5G will really increase the power consumption and so on. So we, we have done quite a lot of work on, on what we call um, breaking the energy curve to really show that with the help of efficient new equipment, with the help of, of integrating our own silicon and so on, we can increase the traffic to the levels we are talking about with 5G and so on without, uh, without increasing the energy that is used to transmit this bit. So I think that's a very important piece that we're able to 
uh, also eat our own dog food in this industry before we can tell other industries to to use it in order to become stronger. So I, I think it's um, and, and here I think the the commission has been on the same track very much with the with the twin transition. I think that's that's super good and fits really well for Europe as well. Maybe if I can have one minute and comment. There was a question also on on 6G and uh, the European Hexa X project and so on, the investments starting up. So I think we are very active, I think together with Nokia, for example, here as well, in order to look at some of these use cases that is, of course, based on 5G, but, but even more extreme when it comes to uh, very much connecting intelligence, networks of networks I, I talked about before, internet of sensors so we we see a lot of things where europe actually can invest early and be early out and we have a strong tradition as i said with starting up 5g work in 2012 and so on. so i think it's even if it's a bit early days for commercial deployment i think it's it's actually something that is starting now and it's i think it's a great opportunity for us and others to be part of thanks a lot michael um cristiano i i, I feel like you know i'm partial because like you i'm italian and we're talking about uh, the, the Italian plans quite a lot, but I'll, I'll use as an excuse the fact that Rita also commented very positively on, on what Italy is doing, but specific, specifically on the RRF, um, is, is, is it possible that Italy got it right? Um, Rita commented that 50% of the funds of the digital part is, is going to connectivity. You uh, explained very well the, uh, the, the national broadband plan so is it, you know, how do you see particularly the way that uh, Italy is looking at making use of the funds to sustain private investment through the use of funds also longer term? Is that happening? Is that a positive trend that you see Italy is, is, is using with the funds? Yeah, thanks, Alberto. I think you touch a very important point in the sense that uh, um, let's say the success of the plan depends uh, on one side, of course, on the proper implementation in the next month and years, but also on the possibility to get uh, proper investment from the private side. This is a critical point where, let's say, um, some of the point in this implementation or in these steps were maybe highlighted by some of the speaker or by, by our as Digital Europe uh, report. I would like to touch uh, a few points. Okay, one is that uh, the uh, let's say the somehow complex uh, processes and regulation for investments. I think that uh, looking to Italy, at least that I know better, uh, there is a need of simplification of the investment in order to make uh, this uh, more easy. And at the same time, there is, as we mentioned, the the need of a um, rationalization, harmonization of the rules uh, at European level. For example, in Italy, the uh, limits for electromagnetic emission are different from the one in Europe. And so makes uh, somehow uh, more uh, or less uh, uh, profitable the investment from the operators. One critical point uh, looking to the operators, because they are among the major investment, of course, in also on the private side in this moment, uh, is that uh, uh, in, there is in this moment uh, the, uh, for them the, the last tranche of payment uh, for the frequencies of the 5G frequencies and at the same time uh, there is uh, uh, the need of the investment uh, not for the white areas but also for the other areas uh, in order to develop and so of course uh, um, this is a critical point that has to be touched uh, with the proper attention because uh, um, let's say that, that this let's say multiple investment at the same time may become a critical aspect. One point that was touched um, in uh, also by, by, by other uh, before me is that uh, we really need the development of uh, uh, specialized figures. Uh, this I think uh, we, 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 we tell every day about this need let's say, of, uh, of gender parity, but also of expert uh, overall that we, we miss. We miss people in big data and analytics. We miss people in cybersecurity, in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, in high performance computing, just to touch some of the aspects. And if we don't have enough people, okay, this will be a limit uh, to really the growth uh, in Europe uh, and for sure in Italy. 
just to give you an example, just this morning there was uh, a call by the Italian cybersecurity agents uh, of uh, 50 uh, to hire 50 experts in in that field. And uh, and uh, okay, by the way, I can mention that they received very well the the letter that we as Digital Europe co-signed with. Uh, uh, Practically all the European NTA have sent to them about the current crisis and the need of uh, exploit better cybersecurity activities. On the, um, let's say, the other point that I would like to touch is that um, uh, digital is, is transversal and uh, the possibility to real uh, make investment is on the capability for all the industry, for all the people to develop new use, case, new use cases to exploit, uh, let's say, additional services to provide more service to the people and to the industries. For example, I think uh, the, uh, we, we often say that uh, um, green and digital are twins. And that's right, because as Michael was saying, there is, uh, of course, uh, to consider that's also digital as a footprint, but at the same time, we can give, uh, let's say, huge advantages and huge saving overall if we utilize, for example, the connectivity spread out in the country to support uh, all the other industries that have to reduce the footprints and uh, the digital content, the connectivity and the application can be let's say, the winning point to really uh, achieve the, the target in Europe to reduce the footprint. Thank you, Cristiano. Um, I see we have, I think, probably at least at least two interesting uh, questions that I would like to address in short order uh, with, the, with the panel. First one, and I think we, we talked about demand side uh, quite a lot, and I think one of the leaps that we we, we know 5G is, is uh, uh, supposed to look at is particularly digital transformation of various industrial sectors. Um, so the, the demand will also come from the B2B side of things more than in the past uh, compared to, to consumer demand, if you will. Uh, and we've also seen quite a lot of spectrum related developments. And there's also the, the related, um, if you will, uh, investment scenarios that, that underlie, if you will, the spectrum discussions, which is who will networks be uh, uh, put in place by, who will run them, how will it work from a business uh, perspective, if you will. And clearly there's there's different points of view there. And I think on, on the panel, we have two companies that, that might have a slightly different perspective. So I'm first gonna check with Pastora and Mikael if they wanna comment, both of you, uh, whoever wants to comment, and then I'll ob obviously I'll probably go to Rita for, for her perspective there. As the judge, or well, I know, I think she she is the closest <laughs> thing we have to a judge, indeed. Mikael, go ahead. No, so I think on on um, the digitalization of of industries and so on. I think there was a reason that we started very early with talking to the possible users already from when we had trial systems in 2015, because we understood that it will take very long time for them to get used to something they haven't really used before. So many of these ecosystems and so on, take manufacturing as an example, are extremely, extremely um, traditional. It takes long time to change. So I think for us, it's been very good to provide a number of different tools. I don't think that all these kind of energies will use, industries will use the same tools. But I think that there is um, there is great benefits for using the predictable, secure, scalable technologies and so on that that is kind of winning from the scale paid by the smartphone user. So in many many of these areas, we see that even if some people believe that the traditional models in some areas are old and boring, it has a number of benefits when it comes to cost, proven in combat, security, and, and things like that. So of course, we focus a lot of supporting people with, with the technologies we provide, but it, it's not the only thing that will happen, of course. Thank you, Mikael. Pastora, checking with you, if you, if you want to uh, speak about this quickly. You're still on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think actually this pandemic has accelerated this transition in many industrial verticals, and they have had to. So indeed, there were operational issues. There are issues also about talent and skills. There are issues about you know complexity. 
and that we have a role to play as vendors to make it also simpler. Um, but we have seen an incredible acceleration of digitization in many sectors, from transportation to agriculture, to automobile sector, to um, you know agri-food. And so I think um, I think that's that's a trend, right? So and I think it's really um, a role as well to make sure that we can create ecosystems. That we, I mean, in many of these projects, it's not just one. Uh, company. There are many companies, but there is also the applications. There is also so we are also learning as we um, create more and more of these business models. And I think as we learn and understand the efficiencies and the outcomes, it will you know again sharing. It's going to be very important. And I think from the commission perspective, right, the role as well to understand there are countries that are going to be ahead in particular sector, whether it's tourism, whether it's automobile, right. And I think it's important that we also you know, understand why it worked in a particular sector, in a particular country, and how can we replicate in other, in other countries? Thank you, Pastora. Also checking with Rita, if she has any thoughts you want to spare with her. <clears throat> yes, may maybe I can, uh, I, I fully subscribe to actually both uh, visions, but um, maybe, maybe to, to have a kind of high level take on this. I mean, I think uh, one of the interesting elements of what we are discussing is that um, I think there are three elements in which um, uh, the, the landscape around us is fundamentally changing. And uh, that would also maybe give hope that the uh, problems that we have partially been facing in the past uh, might really change. And so I think one of those is the new use cases that was already mentioned. So, I think that the business models that were based on uh, consumer subscriptions in the past will change and will also have uh, fundamentally different uh, business models based on network slicing, on vertical industries. So, so that will um, at least put a question mark uh, with whether the problems we faced in the past will also um, determine the future. That's one element. The other element is, I think, the landscape is also changing in terms of the companies are changing. So if we only look at mobile, we can see that there are more and more tower companies. So more and more companies are separating their assets. And, um, and also we see such a development in the fixed industry where there are more and more independent players, where there are also, um, also kind of wholesale only uh, players and also uh, co-investment uh, structures. And what I also understand is that uh, maybe also because of the, um, more, the the larger financial leeway that is anyway there uh, in all markets, that uh, telecom investments are becoming more and more attractive also to different categories of investors. So it's not only the, the traditional, let's say, investment banks, but it's also the pension funds and the, the investors with a longer breath who, um, if I look at a recent study uh, we carried out with the commission, who say that uh, telecoms infrastructure investments are an indispensable part of their portfolio. So I think on, on the basis of these three developments, one can see the landscape is changing and it will be a challenge uh, to uh, indeed meet our targets, uh, um, uh, also taking this into account. But uh, I think basically these could be promising developments that we use for the better. Thank you, Rita. Uh, I have we have probably time for one final uh, question, and um, I, I think uh, one interesting one where you know also we saw a, a number of responses from uh, from uh, experts is around the fears around 5G. So about public perception, I think you all know this this debate. It is something that I think shaped. Uh, particularly, you know, the, the also the the discussions around auctions and in, in, in the public domain quite a lot, uh, and clearly there's a lot of fears, uh, health concerns. Uh, I go back. I think I've, I was I witnessed a number of presentations about the health risks of 5G that really started from uh, decade-old studies about the negative impact of Wi-Fi on health. So it's, it's a longer discussion and, and it comes back in waves over radio waves. Uh, is, is there a way to solve it? Uh, and obviously I know that public authorities in particular are very much focused on this. Industry is focused on this. Is this, you think, something that will persist and that we'll need to continue to address? Um, whoever wants to take this first can go first. May I? Yes. 
Yes, let's say uh, one one comment in that is that uh, if I'm looking to to the approach, uh, is that uh, we overall uh, probably have been lacking uh, the a proper communication since the beginning of the advantages of 5G. So say uh, I think most of the people is seeing the 5G as a, a, a natural, let's say, evolution of what there was before, uh, maybe providing some additional capacity, but. Uh, um, uh, Let's say we, we really need to, to explain to the public the big advantages and the, the new services that can be provided by 5G. And these are not so, of course, the experts are aware of that, but the common people are not so, uh, let's say, this knowledge is not so spread out. And of course, uh, the starting from what is giving more the 5G is a first point that in my view to address. So it's not, let's say, because we have three and then four and now we have five, but we want to give more services to the people, to the industries. For this reason, we need a technological step that is the 5G. So starting this point. The other, I guess that, um, uh, of course, we can try to push uh, in a third party uh, reports uh, that show that uh, 5G is, uh, is uh, is something that uh, there is at with 4G and, and 3G in the past. So there is no additional uh, risk or whatsoever with respect to the other, at least this in, in my view. Thank you, Geno. I, I think I'll give the last word to Rita here and then we'll, unfortunately we'll have to close the panel, but Rita, go ahead. Okay, so so well, I think from the, from the commission's perspective, uh, there are two elements to this. And one element is we need to base ourselves in this context on the latest available research, scientific information on uh, whether um, uh, there can be any way in which these uh, 5G radio waves are harmful or not. And the commission is always working on updating its knowledge. And currently there's also a scientific commission that is looking at whether our standards need to be updated. So that's the first part. And I think the second part is, and that is also addressed partially in the connectivity toolbox, member states need to work together to make sure that the, the, on the basis of the most recent scientific information, the communication to the public is adequate. So uh, we need to make sure that also we work together in giving proper information, also giving uh, information from public authorities to um, the wider public in order to make sure that whatever um, people may feel about this, they have the public information and the objectively justified information sources to base their decisions on. Thanks, and I think that's what we're working on. Uh, working on, we're constantly practicing, basically. Thanks a lot, Rita. Uh, and, and with this, I'd like to very briefly thank all my panelists for, I think, a very dense discussion. Uh, there's a lot of points. Uh, this is a very complex, as I like uh, to, to say, matter. With this is the first discussion, if you will, uh, we'd be more than pleased to, to continue uh, and, and expand into uh, topics that we haven't perhaps touched on. Um, just to uh, maybe give a few um, uh, highlights of what we discussed, I think uh, there's been a lot of talks about what's happening uh, with the funds. We've seen extensive talk, probably too much talk about Italy, but I think it is a good uh, example of living use of national strategies and the RRF funds. Um, so clearly, uh, it is something that we have to focus on. It's a clear recommendation that we have in our report. Uh, as Rita said, the amount of funds is unprecedented. We need to use the funds to the fullest uh, extent, and we need to use them uh, now and, and, and wisely. And, and hopefully, I think the, the commission has been working with member states uh, uh, to that. Clearly, there's there's a, lot, a number of things that we can do in, in the immediate term. Uh, the connectivity toolbox is, again, something that uh, we need to look at uh, in addition to the other regulatory initiatives uh, that uh, Rita uh, mentioned, BCRD, uh, state aid. Those are all things that are happening in the pipeline. And clearly, we need to at least, you know, come to a full implementation of the code so that we can fully test you know, how well it's, it's been going. Uh, but also, I, I, I do hear that there is, particularly on Spectrum, a problem that perhaps persists and that you know, probably needs to generate some further uh, discussion there. 
uh, because it, it does appear to be one of the elements that we all that always pops up in discussions, and we've discussed about the targets and the prospects for 6G. And inevitably, one day we will have 6G auctions. So we'll be uh, on, on this topic uh, very, very much so. Uh, again, um, uh, I I do check one. I do want to check one final time if we have Cecilia for some final thoughts. Uh, if if she is. Okay, so no, I've been listening really carefully to this discussion, and I'm, I must say it's a super good panelist, right? You all have a quite a, a high amount of uh, practical experience in, in, in what you're doing, which raises uh, the, the discussion to a totally different level. Maybe one thing that, that I catched in the, in the end, uh, and uh, I think it was Cristiano who said it, and Cristiano said, um, I don't think that the benefits of 5G has been very comprehensible for the people and companies that are, that are needing it. Um, and I mean, maybe this is it. If we look at Korea, uh, South Korea, okay, they said now we're going to have 5G, and they implement it because they they see the vision from public point of view. Um, whereas in Europe, we are waiting more for the demand side, and if the demand side has not really been clear, we also have to challenge ourselves as an industry. Why is it that our narrative has not been clear? I mean, why is it that we have not been able to tell how different 5G is? And, uh, and, uh, and how much we need it. Um, but still, I would say it's a two-way street, right? Um, there is no one questioning whether we should have highways. So there is no uh, government, government that says, like, no, 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 let's cancel the highways, or we don't need to fix them, just let them become bumpy roads with holes in them, right? So no, no, that's always on the, on, on, on the investment side. So how is it that we get these old bumpy roads you know, back in a shape where we can actually transport digital, secure, high-speed highways for the community that we are, a highly developed digital society in Europe, where who actually, and maybe uh, some of the old and last players in the digital sphere with a European headquarters is in this sector. And if we are standing, I mean, my vision is that in 10 years, I'm looking at a Europe where we are able to attract uh, foreign players, foreign investment, but that we also keep our European headquarters, great companies here, and that we actually believe that investment in digital infrastructure is far more important than fixing our highways, uh, because that is the future, and more and more people will work from home, more and more companies will create their value from data, uh, and this already happened in the world. This is what we can keep com competing against, so my question is just like, shouldn't we just get it done and uh, make sure that we actually have a European governance model on this and that the countries actually do uh, implement uh, and um, and to make sure that, you know, auctions are uh, actually coordinated. So I would say back in game. I mean, we can do this. Uh, Europe has shown again and again, and once we make a decision, we can actually mobilize at a speed. But we shouldn't wait until the infrastructure is too old, too insecure, too outdated, and we don't have any players left in market. So with that, I would just say, uh, let's get it done and let's see if we're here in a year again and investment is boosted and everybody understands that uh, the, the, the 5G and high-speed connections are actually uh, the future and uh, even more important than the old bumpy highways. Thank you.